This is a map of roads in Denmark, and this is a map of roads in France, this is one of Sweden, and this is one of Spain. As you can see, the density of roads in Denmark is considerably higher than in pretty much all other European countries in respective to their populations. Just to give you the sense of scale, Denmark actually has 12,630 kilometers of roadways per 1 million inhabitants. This number is nearly 12 times larger than the European average of just 1100 kilometers of road per 1 million people. Now, I know I'm praising Denmark for its roads here, whereas in my other videos, roads are the enemy. But there is a reason for that, and trust me, I'll reveal that later. But even with all these roads, Danes don't ruin poor neighborhoods with highways like they do in America. Instead, Denmark is one of the most connected countries in the world, boasting the Scan Mid Corridor Highway, for example, which is one of Europe's longest highways, stretching 9,400 kilometers through seven different countries. But let's zoom in on Denmark's highways just for a moment here, and you'll see two routes that stand out. One is the current highway, requiring a 500 kilometer detour through the Danish countryside, and the other is a route that crosses the Feman Belt, a route that's currently not possible but has been worked on right now that will shorten travel time by four hours. More on this a bit later. But the reason Denmark has projects like these and this expansive network of bridges, tunnels and roads is because a decent proportion of the country, including Copenhagen, is actually located on islands off of the main peninsula. That means this 4 hour detour is a huge inconvenience to a major part of the country's population and for people moving through the country to go further up into Scandinavia or the other way around. And trust me, Denmark isn't afraid to tackle big infrastructure challenges with even bigger solutions. Take a look at Storbilt, or the Great Belt, which separates two of Denmark's biggest islands. The Great Belt ferries operated here for over a century, moving people from Fyn to Sjælland and back. And they worked just fine, but they weren't efficient. So, the government decided to build the longest suspension bridge in all of Europe to solve a problem that wasn't actually that serious, but was more so a problem of inefficiency. The enormous cost of constructing the bridge was $950 million, and it's still being paid off. So motorists continue to pay nearly 40 US dollars to cross the 6.7 km bridge, making it the only toll road inside of Denmark, except for the one that goes to Sweden, the Öresund Bridge, which also happens to be a mega project in and of itself. I don't want to nerd out about it too much, but it's not just a bridge, it's also a tunnel. Yeah, pretty cool. And it happens to be the longest roadway and railway crossing in Europe, spanning 8 kilometers. However, none of these compares to the technological marvel of engineering that will be the Feman built bridge. This revolutionary piece of engineering is a groundbreaking project featuring a four-lane motorway and two railway lines designed to accommodate both freight and high-speed passenger trains. Spanning the Feman Belt Straits, this innovative project will transform how Danish people move around the country. It establishes high-speed rail connections for the first time between Hamburg and Copenhagen and also offers a convenient shortcut for Swedes to access the European continent while bypassing Copenhagen and most Danish cities. The trains on this bridge are expected to reach speeds exceeding 1200 km per hour, substantially reducing passenger and freight travel time. This will reduce congestion in Copenhagen by diverting most traffic from Malmö to Hamburg through a more direct route. The result is that what once took four and a half hours will now be accomplished in just two and a half hours. For the people of Copenhagen, this also provides the opportunity to travel to continental Europe without a lengthy detour through the Danish mainland. Now, you may be thinking, for a country that is so flat, is this even necessary? 
Well, you see, while countries like Norway have harsh geographical challenges with their tall mountains and spacious fjords, Denmark has its own set of challenges that you may not expect. For centuries, Denmark's biggest weakness has been to overcome its relatively small geographical size. The country is significantly smaller than its neighbors, including the large industrial powerhouses of Germany and Sweden, of course, excluding Greenland. And just a side note here, have you ever wondered how we make these maps and wanted to learn how to make them yourself? Well, if you have, you're in luck. Because I've partnered up with Skillshare to give you guys a 30 minute course in how I make my maps that is live right now. And if you somehow don't know what Skillshare is by now, it's an online learning community with thousands of online classes and members. Skillshare has everything you need to go from passion to paycheck or seed your side hustle. Whether you want to build a subscriber base for your email newsletter, use AI tools to increase your productivity, or open your first Etsy shop, Skillshare can help you get there. Their world-class community connects teachers and members to inspiration and feedback from like-minded creatives. They stand for a learn-by-doing approach to teaching, where each member can create and share a project after completing a class. And it's an on-demand platform with stackable lessons, which means you can learn at your own pace, no matter the skill level. And the first 500 people to use my link will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. So what are you waiting for? Join Skillshare today by using my link in the description down below. Thank you Skillshare for sponsoring this video. This means that Denmark has fewer natural resources, but also less space available for farming and human settlement. Due to the country's small size, whatever they build must be meticulously planned and purpose-driven at every stage. And this is where Denmark sets itself apart from other countries. You see, the Danes have found a unique way to overcome this challenge, and it's called systemization. From furniture to architecture and beyond, everything created by Danes is characterized by a deliberate sense of purpose and organization. You could say that the Danes have an inherent talent for design, with their focus on functionality and simplicity, enabling them to seamlessly connect human society to the natural environment. Following the devastation caused by World War II, urban planners in Copenhagen went back to the drawing board to completely overhaul the city, unveiling the Five Finger Plan in 1947. The idea was to prevent urban sprawl by allowing only five areas where city planners could develop residential and commercial neighborhoods. These five corridors were chosen for existing railway networks, followed conveniently to Copenhagen's business district. The idea was to preserve green spaces while retaining existing transportation connections, creating room for expansion and development where needed. This approach encouraged residents and visitors in high-density business and historical districts to voluntarily travel less by car and instead use other methods like biking or the well-developed metro system. I currently live in Copenhagen, and Copenhagen is as close to a bike utopia you can possibly get without going to Utrecht in the Netherlands. Metro stations include bike parking, including over 7,000 places at the central train station. And if we've designed bikes into our public transit infrastructure, you can bet we've baked it into our urban planet too. We have 350 kilometers of bike lanes built in the city, so pretty much everywhere we've converted some of our normal roads into bike-only roads, and wildest of all, our bike paths cut through the city in a way cars could only dream of. A great example is the Gronesti, where you can travel kilometers mostly surrounded by greenery and calmness, despite the city being all around you. It's beautiful and efficient, but don't worry, bike lanes are not exclusive to Copenhagen, we have them all across Denmark. I lived in a small town as a kid, and even there it was possible to bike to school. On top of the bike infrastructure, people can also bring their bikes on buses, trains, and metros. And trains literally have entire sections dedicated just to bikes, like a moving parking garage for bikes. It's pretty insane. Trains and metros are integrated with the bus system to create a reliable and systematic transport network. The A buses are the primary buses in the city centre, with the S buses focusing on the 
suburbs. The A bus meets local needs with ultra frequent and reliable buses to travel within the city, while the S bus takes fewer stops to quickly travel to and from the city center. As an example, I use the A bus to go from Nurport Station to Frederiksberg Hospital when I had a broken arm a few months ago. It's fine now, by the way. <laughs> But anyway, the two bus systems interlink in certain parts of the city, and the metro and train networks are designed with the same interconnectivity in mind. Compared to London's impressive underground and overground network, Copenhagen arguably has the more impressive and well thought out system. For London's nearly 10 million inhabitants, Transport for London offers Londoners 272 stations, while for Copenhagen's 600,000 inhabitants, the Copenhagen metro system when combined with the S network trains, offers a total of 123 stations. In fact, an additional 17 new stations were added in 2019 under the City Ring Metro project, which should reduce congestion and increase mobility in the broader metropolitan area. And I cannot tell you how often I've used these. They run night and day, and it's amazing. But given our geographical size, there is an absolute necessity for Denmark to build large engineering structures with high capacity to seamlessly blend different transportation networks, be it trains, planes, cars, or trams. The importance of Denmark in the overall European road and transportation network adds pressure on the Danish government to prioritize a well-designed system. But it wasn't always this way. In fact, while Danish urban designs and quality of life are now the envy of the world, the early 2000s marked a period of neglect and catastrophe for its railway transportation system. While cities still had good transportation connections, the remainder of the country was neglected by the national rail operator Bane Denmark. As an average, the tracks were five years over the recommended safety limits. Over the summer of 2006, the country experienced some of its worst months in history, experiencing major delays due to significant levels of track maintenance and signal failure. Trains had to dramatically reduce speeds and frequencies across the entire network, leaving most trains running late. For the Danish government, this was the final straw before embarking on a long transformation and remodernization program for the entire network. In 2009, the Danish parliament decided to take on one of the most ambitious infrastructure projects in Europe by replacing its signaling systems with ERT, or better known as the European Rail Traffic Management System. To digitize the network and make driverless trains possible, the modernization process will be complete by 2030, simplifying the national network, reducing maintenance costs, increasing network capacity and the overall speed of trains using this system, opening up a future possibility for high-speed rail upgrades. But with its focus on improving service frequency and high-quality commuter and express trains, high-speed trains are hardly a priority. Considering the track retrofitting required to accommodate high-speed travel, current agreements are in place to implement this ERT system over 1200 kilometers of tracks or half of the country's total network. Unlike countries like the UK, the Danish government still owns 80% of the country's railways and refuses to divide or sell them to private companies. In fact, government control of the train network has made it easier to integrate other transport networks to the railways, like buses and metros. Take the newly proposed Storstrom Bridge that will connect Masnilu to Falster. This 4km long bridge includes a two-lane divided highway, dual-track railway, a bicycle path and even a pedestrian path. This bridge hopes to connect a key artery between Copenhagen and Germany and a central railway in Europe. It will replace the existing bridge that has been in use since 1937 with a multi-purpose and multi-level transport infrastructure. This has been made possible because in Denmark, Infrastructure planning involves both the public and private sector, with clearly defined roles for both parties. Private corporations are responsible for material and construction costs, while the government considers the project's functionality and relevance to society. This approach creates an incentive to design long-lasting solutions from the outset and helps control costs. This is exactly how the Femman Bell project was designed. The government makes it possible to build high-quality infrastructure at a predictable cost to developers. While developers in other countries need to ask parliament for permission to build certain projects, this is not the case here in Denmark. 
and certainly not the case for Denmark's possibly largest infrastructure project of the century so far. This genius way of governing ensures its citizens enjoy great economic prospects, a high quality of life, and a well-connected country. Now, I've been waiting eagerly to tell you about this, but another thing that really impresses me about Denmark is how digitized it is. Anything and everything you could think of is online. Want to start a company? Well, you just fill out this online form and your request is sent in five minutes. Within 24 hours, your company has been registered and you get your company number and can start making your millions. It's that easy. How about your medical records? Well, you just log in and a few clicks later you have it on your screen and you can also book an appointment with your doctor, who is free by the way. New address? Denmark has you covered. Two minutes and a few clicks on this website and you're done. You've now officially moved. Don't like to carry your driver's license? Don't worry, we've got an app for that. Want to request a scholarship from the government? It's right here. Yes, that's a thing and it's about $1,100 per month, no strings attached. You basically get paid to study here. You, you get the point. Everything is digitized and it's amazing. And even the Reisecord is finally going to be digital as well. It's a transportation card that for some reason is a plastic card right now, but we might as well just have it on our phones I mean, we've been stuck with these stupid plastic cards for too long, man. It, it's ridiculous. And the fact that I'm complaining about this and the few efficiencies we do have in the country just shows how privileged we really are to live in such an efficient country. As a Dane, I'm proud of how well organized my country is, although I certainly don't think it's a perfect place. But I do want to point out that nothing in life is free. The efficient and plentiful public transit, free healthcare and education all come at a cost. Higher taxes. The average income tax of a Danish worker is over 35% nearly 10 percentage points higher than the OECD average. The result is that everything works wonderfully, but is it worth the price? That's not for me to decide, but let me know what you think in the comments down below about all this. I'd love to hear your thoughts. But that's it for this video, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.